We lost an under-21 All-Ireland final against Kerry on the Saturday. Um, I was in DIT studying marketing and I was commuting. I was going in every day and we lost that final. And I was so disappointed about losing that final that I didn't go into my end of, end of year exams on the Monday. I just refused to go into them and I dropped out of DIT. <laughs> Mickey Hart here. You're listening to the GAR Football Show. The GA Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. I'm not finished yet, it took me a long time to get here. So we'll start with the good news, uh, Conan and Connor. That is TG Cahir's first game this weekend is 145. Straight so after I'll, dinner. Be, I'll be lucky to finish my dinner now <laughs> when I complain about that. That's too early. <laughs> no, so that's great. So 145 and a brilliant game as well. Bally Gunner versus Patrick's Wells. You're straight away, you're into GEA. You've been distracted by nothing else. And then the deferred game is at, uh, well, it's live at 2 p.m. And that's coming on after that. That's Cora Finn and Ballantubber. And I'll absolutely keep my phone. I won't, I, uh, sometimes I listen to RT Radio 1 who are very good at jumping around all the grounds and have mm. reporters. I'll keep away from them and watch Cora Finn and Ballantubber as live. So that's great. Two great games. And, uh, you know, like, I mean, while we, I criticised TG Cahar, um, there was a piece in the Examiner from the Ker- who was they were talking about the Kerry County final and TG Cahar wanted to show that and the Kerry County Board wouldn't allow it. So the Kerry County Board showed their two, quarter, two of their quarterfinals on a Saturday night um, on RTE. And the board estimated that it was a 35% reduction in attendance compared to the equivalent quarterfinals in previous years. And they said they didn't want to risk a similar fall off in crowds resulting in more income for the final because their main source of income, they want about 10,000 at the final. It's their main source of income. And they're like, if they put it on television, I can see this from all sides. I can mm. see mm. TG Cahar obviously being hamstrung by not being allowed by county boards. I can see why county boards don't allow it. I suppose the solution here is for TG Cahar to pay the county board the shortfall of what they would lose out on, you know, because, yeah. you know, um, I wouldn't think TG Cahar have the budget to do that. Mm. And that's why maybe the situation, this is the situation that we have been in. But we're OK now. We're in provincial championships now which start earlier yeah and TGK would probably get the same audience for another game anyway somewhere else like Ballantubber Corathan so rather than pay like all that extra exactly money to get it off game. somebody else I, I'm actually wondering why any county board allow it then if there's that much of a short, uh, a drop I suppose it's promotion of the games in that county it, like it, it, it's all everything's a brand I suppose at the same time and if there's a great yeah. county final it's the talk of the country you know so there are benefits obviously of showing the game on TG Cahar as well right it, it is an interesting one I don't know what you lads think but a game being on TV doesn't really stop me going to the match. Like, I would look at that fixture and be like, Oh, it would stop me. Would it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Loads of factors. Yeah. If it was raining now, I would Saturday night and it was raining. If it was raining, I wouldn't go. And then the on journey, television. traffic, loads of, the, loads of different things come into it for me. Yeah, yeah. but it's just, there's something, I don't sound like a walking billboard for club championships, <laughs> but there is something different about being there, like, you know, and taking it all in and, just being amongst us, you know. Ah, like no, of course there is all things being equal on a fine day. <laughs> <laughs> after it, you've had the dinner. If, it, if, if you're after having a dinner and, you know, you're not really inclined to get off the couch, the fire's on, it's pissing rain outside, that match is on television, you're not going over to yeah. it. Come on. <laughs> Anyways, so, listen, could you, this, considering you're such a club aficionado, Conan, this is going to upset you a little bit. So, Maliki, we kind of touched on this on Monday. And we're talking about the club season not having kicked off yet. Mm. And it kind of got me thinking about it. It hasn't. You know, you're you're not seeing the same interaction on Twitter about the games. There hasn't been brilliant games. Then you're kind of wondering, is it because TG Cahar are showing them too late? And I'm wondering about that. And then you're wondering, you know, are you missing the good ones? And are the county boards not allowing them to show ones that they potentially would have shown? All those things. But in my head, this club season, which I love, I'm not invested in it as much as I, I usually am. And then I'm thinking back um, to last year and usually it's the provincial club that really gets me going rather than the county finals. So Maliki's talking about this and like, I mean, I was reading a lot of the replies from the article um, on Twitter and people aren't happy about this, but Maliki absolutely has a point. He says, at the same time, it frequently feels like we make bigger claims for the club championship than they deserve. You get told a lot about that this is the real GEA as if inter-county stuff is a figurey um, or a luxury or a little more than a sop to the GEA as if you're somehow less than pure if you prefer July evening in Parky Kiev to a winter afternoon here he said the club championships have their charms of course to do but you wouldn't want to overstate them either even if you remove November grey from them they'll still be local affairs cared about deeply by, by, but singularly by local people they can't plug into the communal heft that sustains and drives the GEA summer 
I completely agree. Now, he's talking about uh, championship restructures and some of the most popular ones have the intercounty season finishing in July. And he's kind of arguing, God, well, then you would be stuck with stuff that's only important locally for the rest of the year. Yeah. And I can see that concern. But that's only for county final season, right? And I completely agree. County finals, really, unless it's, uh, I don't know, two kind of famous clubs, is really only important. He's using the example of Boris Lee versus Killadangan last week in the hurling. It really only has local interest, maybe a little bit in the county and not an awful lot outside of that, outside of real diehards. But my kind of point of this is, and I accept that, any restructure, you probably have a bit of downtime in August and halfway through September while the club championships get going and the county finals kind of are seen out and then you'll start seeing some live games around county final time. But then when you come out of that right now, now we have Ballygunner versus Patrickswell. That's, you know, Waterford versus Limerick. Now you're plugging back into the county mm. rivalry. Now you have Corrafin versus Ballantober, Mayo versus um, Galway. Now you're plugging back into it because I know with Port Leash, we were terribly supported down through the years with Port Leash. It's just a big town and would have a small GA community. And then you run out in the first round of the Leinster Club and there's a big roar for you. And you wonder, where's all these supporters come out? They're Leash fans who come out to, to see Port Leash are representing Leash. And now it becomes Leash. You know, so what, while I, I do accept Maliki's point of view on the club, I think provincial club, the world is your oyster with that and All-Ireland semi-final, All-Ireland final. Do you know what I mean? I, I think that when people want to make space in the calendar, I think club players deserve their time in August and September if it finishes in July. But I think we can make a huge big deal out of the end of September and all of October and a bit of November club seat you know what I mean club seat and plug back into that inter-county rivalry will Galway beat Mayo this year can Ballantubber you know repay Cora Finn you know and win mm. one back for Mayo and now you're plugging back into Mayo fans do you get me I think there, yeah. there is, a, there is a, an opportunity there I think, I think there is I actually yeah, I agreed with sort of Maliki's overall point I didn't really necessarily agree with a lot of the arguments he was making within it I would hate to see the county season shorten too much because it is the best thing like you know when mm. Like any, like, you know, no matter if it's Port Leash against Kilmacud Croaks, you know, Dublin versus Leash or whatever, you're not going to get a million people tuning in like you would on the final day. You know, say, like, so it just doesn't compare to that, to that point of view. So, like, when I hear people talk about restructures and sometimes, like, to say, just get rid of the league and we'll have that as a championship. But I like having two things, no matter what it is, because it just prolongs the county season. So I would hate to lose that. And what I think that he was sort of a, missing a bit from his argument is that, club season is like it's for players anyway it's, it's it's not really a spectator thing it's like you know from junior to senior 32 counties everybody's playing our games now again yeah. and maybe the biggest argument for that is like giving them a bigger window to play you know so like you yeah. know, they can have actually a chance to play but yeah um, it's I not all about tv figures either it's a, it's a, it's about having space in the calendar for them i do accept the point in august september you don't have those big blockbuster games but i think they can be replaced not replaced but they can, we can have October as a huge month of provincial club. You know, it yeah. won't be as big as inter-county. Obviously, you couldn't compare it to an all final. But I'm sure they would do well. You yeah, know? I, think, I, I think so. Like, I, I tend to agree with you, Conan. I, I got where Meliki was getting at with his, with his overall team, mm -hmm. but tended to disagree with some of the arguments. One of the things he said was um, that club finals uh, matter who they matter to and not much more beyond that. I, I, I don't know about that. Like, I think it's more than that. I, did, I, I think I didn't realise how much I was into club finals elsewhere until they, until they started showing them on TG mm -hmm. Carr. And I think TG Carr awoke to that as well by the fact that they said they'd take a punt in it and then they realised what a massive appetite there was for club finals elsewhere. Like, I think Maliki made some good points about the OTT marketing of the club and maybe yeah. it's blown up to be something that is I think that Mount Leinster Rangers speech, speech is burned into my memory <laughs> yeah, now at yeah. this stage but at the same time then I was thinking well we make the point all the time about the lack of marketing for the All-Ireland Championship before it happens so maybe it's a bit rich of us then to be complaining about the club game being built up to be a little more than yeah. what it is I don't think it's built up I think there's a lot of virtue signaling going on yeah, there to is use that, that word about yeah. club people on Twitter going oh that's a disgrace I wouldn't even entertain like you know what I mean there's a lot of outrage around the club and I, don't, I think it can be faux outrage a lot of the time that like I mean everybody wants the club to have a, a section of the year there's no doubt about that but I don't see people as in real life 
I don't see people as exercised about it as you might uh, see yeah. online. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, the same <laughs> yeah. people won't go to a, like all they have to do is maybe go to a club meeting and mention that so the club delegates can bring it to a county meeting and make a big deal of it. And then they just don't do that. Yeah. And then the CPA will send out loads of surveys. And the same people that were giving out about it on Twitter won't take the time to actually fill out those yeah, surveys yeah. and do what they have to do to make a difference. So you're right about that mm. virtue signaling. Element. Yeah, I'm a great club man. I want, I want to be seen <laughs> as a great, yeah. you know, believer in the club. The GA has lost its soul. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so popular right yeah, now. Like, like, you start. Yeah. You start hammering about this and there's a huge audience there mm. like they're ready to go this yeah. is how to be woke in the GA this <laughs> 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 how to be a woke GA follower actually I'm starting to hate these people um, right okay we'll leave, we'll leave that there but it is interesting but I yeah. do think that I think maybe because this is the way it is with me but uh, just the inter-county rivalry born out with the cl- you get the best of both worlds, yeah. I think. So I think this, I think we'll have a really enjoyable month kicking off this Sunday with the inter inter county club rivalries. You know, and, yeah, and absolutely. Hopefully, it does kick off because it does. I think it needs a shot in the arm. The 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 club season. So we have to talk about this Mayo um, County Board uh, meeting the other night. Connor, this is bizarre stuff altogether. This is embarrassing for Mayo. There's no doubt about that. Mayo County Board <laughs> are not coming out well out of this. Like I mean, you've Paul Conan. Um, releasing a statement saying that there was a vote of confidence proposed in the Mayo GA executive at a board's meeting tonight, which was resoundingly passed by all delegates. Now, um, subsequent to this, Charlestown, Sarsfields, Lewisboro, Castlebar Mitchells and Ballycastle all released statements on Twitter saying that their delegates didn't actually vote on it. So what happened at the meeting was someone who wasn't a delegate, I think he was part of the executive, proposed a motion of confidence in the executive. It was immediately seconded. Um, no vote was taken and this was seen because nobody objected at the meeting. This was seen as a re- as in 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 the, the county board's words, a res- was resoundingly passed by all delegates. Now, I was kind of talking to people about this and what happens at county board meetings is that can be proposed and seconded. This can come as a shock to a lot of delegates. It takes a lot of bottle to, to, to immediately stand up and go, well, I propose a counter uh, motion of no confidence you're kind of hit with this you don't really have time a lot of them mightn't have the confidence this is this is something that might need to be kind of planned or you know when it's just landed on you yeah. you don't have it <clears throat> so there was silence bang done let's move on from that resoundingly propo- or you know and no vote so they voted they banned media from county board meetings in the future a vote was taken on that there was no vote taken on the vote of confidence yeah, in and there was the a vote board. taken on the media and yeah. isn't that isn't that outrageous and like, <sighs> yeah yeah, uh, I, I, I know what really. like, <laughs> I was about to say, can we go a week without talking about the Mayo County Board? But when they keep making it difficult for themselves, it's hard not to. And it's not just that Jesus gone way beyond the local story at this stage. It's a, it's a national story and it's it's been a mess from from nearly start to finish. I was saying to you before, Anne Conan, and I think the point has been made already, but isn't it ridiculous that on, on a night where a motion was passed to ban the media from future meetings, we had a situation where there was complete confusion about what had happened actually inside when there was two, there was there was a number of members of the local media stood outside in the cold who if they were actually in that meeting would have been able to report in a fair and transparent spa- yeah. transparent manner on what actually happened and the county board themselves would avoid the mess they've got into since like uh, <laughs> but they don't, see that when you're acting like this you don't want media seeing you yeah. acting well, like this well, this yeah. is shady of the highest order and an- another thing is like I mean it, it doesn't make any sense how to think that they can you know get away with this some of the the, the clubs tweeted their statements. Another uh, email was sent around by the county secretary telling clubs to refrain from using social yeah, media. I've seen that, they don't yeah. want any of this to get out. They want to be able to act with impunity in these meetings, do what they want, and they yeah. don't want the world to know about they've what com- they're doing. It's, this is unreal stuff. They've completely doubled down. It. Like They said that the, the use of social media by clubs beggars belief. Now, that email, in fairness, detailed personal attacks on social, on social media, on officers of the port. On Conan. But that's, Paul listen, Canan, uh, look, I that's, know I, that annoys me, right? Because, like, that's just deflecting away from it. This is yeah. Twitter. People get... Uh, slagged off on Twitter if you're acting shady and you're saying it was resoundingly passed by all delegates clubs come out and say it wasn't voted on you're bound to get some grief on Twitter to start crying yeah. about the PRO getting uh, abuse on Twitter that's completely playing the poor you know the 
playing the the poor boy. Yeah. Look at me and and looking for sympathy. Like one of my things about it is that like the stance of the county board has been very defiant. There's no been no conciliation or no admission of of their own wrongdoing in this approach at all. They've been pointing fingers left, right, and centre. And I don't know are they aware that like what's turned into what had been a few dissenting voices in the county has turned into blanket disapproval. It's all anybody is talking about in Mayo this week. You don't even have to have an interest in club football or club J county J whatever. Everybody's talking about it and. The county board have made a rod for their own back, and there's been no acknowledgement that, of that whatsoever. It would be, it's not going to solve anything, but geez, it would be nice to say. I know there was, I think Paul Cunyon apologised for, I don't know, do we talk about this when he played, when the, the playing of Shoe the Donkey. Uh, oh, the song no. Shoe the I, I chose the not to mention that. Game. That was okay. so cringeworthy that I, know, I, I didn't. I know, I know, but that, that was the only, that's yeah. been the only admission of wrongdoing that I can see in the in this whole mess. Uh, and and they've, they've just got even more defined and it just seemed to be. Uh, as you said, just 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 ignoring their own role in this mess, and just he seemed to be happy to be pointing fingers elsewhere, and it's just, I I don't know, it's just embarrassing for all concerned. Yeah, so Connelly or Connolly, the chairman, he we spoke about him a couple of weeks ago. You weren't here, Connor, and he was actually being humble enough. He was talking about how difficult it is that they're running small businesses. They don't necessarily have the expertise, you know. Whereas uh, a small business with a turnover of about 4 million, which Mayo County Board has, might have a staff of 10 professionals. They don't. And I was like, you know, he's being humble about this. He's accepting that it's a really difficult job. And then he acts like, then they're kind of pulling stunts like this and you're wondering, what is going on there? I think one of the other disappointing things is there's a statement of his during the rounds from 2014. And he's talking about there was poor communication in Mayo in the past and we need to start becoming a bit more professional, you know, in the way we're operating things, you know, and that's five years ago and we're, <laughs> we're here now in this position yeah. five years later. Like, I don't know, and I get sort of, no, I'm not comparing him to the FAI, but remember John Delaney at the Arractus and somebody, like he was just reading out his statement and didn't say anything else and somebody made the point to him, if you wanted to clear your name, like surely you would speak now and start like telling everybody what's actually happened like if you did nothing wrong but you know he didn't obviously yeah. and like this is the same now with this what, what I think it's like surely you would like take the opportunity to, to show everybody like actually no it's just a confusion here here's what actually happened but they're not doing that they're banning media instead yeah that's in, their answer in, in fairness to them they weren't allowed to talk about the, the supporters yeah. association or the, another claim by that, Eugene Rooney for legal reasons so yeah. I suppose that have to be, has to be pointed out as well yeah well conveniently I suppose you would say like I mean it's easy to hide behind that as well like I mean this it just keep going back to the same point Bring in a CEO that runs the company, which it is. Let these fellas keep their power that they think they have. They're not running the ship. The ship is run by a professional. If they want to squabble about who's in control of what and have all their meetings and do what they want, it's irrelevant to how this company is run. So Mm. you have your CEO, your marketing department, whatever you need, commercial director. There's two. I'd say you'd have two. And that would be enough. Let them run the company and let them delegate jobs to these fellas and let them continue with their meetings. Let them vote each other in in and out every year and let them play their politics. It's irrelevant to how that company is run because this is a complete farce of a situation that all this is in the backdrop of these fellas are meant to be running a four million a year turnover company. (laughs) It's bizarre, lads, isn't it? And like, I mean, I... I think it was about four years ago I suggested that GEA needs to just send in a CEO in every county board 100 grand a year be in around 3 million a year it'll pay for itself just do it and the answer from Parik Duffy that time was well we don't get involved in the way county boards run their business there uh, they have autonomy and all this it's like look where autonomy's getting you yeah. Yeah. Like, but Mike Connolly made the direct uh, shout out to Crow Park he yeah, said yeah, Crow he Park needs to get involved yeah, here, like. yeah no exactly right listen the GPA have uh, published uh, results from a student report um, from this year and there's some fairly uh, eye-catching numbers in it and results in it so they're under four different um, uh, categories welfare academic well-being and finance and leave off the finance I'm not too interested in that but the welfare one is interesting 80 per- 83% are playing uh, with at least three teams uh, 81% take part in social activities less than most other people their age no surprises there 70% travel home for training three or more times per week. That was very high. You would think managers aren't br- dragging students home, you know, for training outside the weekends. Um, even when I was going to college 20 years ago, you weren't dragged home during the week. You know, weekend is the Friday night or whatever is enough. 48% felt confident to talk to their county manager about a reduced training load. So these are kind of some of the the, the numbers. Under academic, 
which I thought was interesting. 35% had to repeat a college exam. 11% had to re- repeat an entire academic year. 65% feel their training load negatively affects their academic performance. That's massive. Mm. 65% of them think that it's, it's uh, stepping over on their academic performance. 54% don't receive supports from the College of Drone Pressure. 48% felt more like an inter-county player than a student trying to earn a degree. Like, I mean, I think that's shocking, though. 65% feel that their training load negati- uh, negatively affects their academic performance. I, I don't know. Like, I mean, there's no student should have to be worrying about that. And this is linked in to the 70 percent being travel traveling home three days a week and making mm-hmm. them do commutes mm-hmm. and everything like the fix here is probably with managers at club level, leave them alone. Yeah. During the week and intercounty, stop dragging them home. Like, I mean, let them do their studies, let them train on their own. See a lot of companies now letting people work from home. G- give them like if they want to be serious players, they're going to do the training. Like, ironically, if you're a, a county player, you're almost better looked after because the club aren't, aren't dragging you back. But imagine you're just sort of in between or you're playing under 20s and you're playing with your college and then your club still wants you back as well. You have to be sort of trying to keep everybody happy. And like, to be honest, when I looked at that originally, the, the training load, I always thought, you know, training is good for you when you're trying to study. You can't study <coughs> every hour of every day. But then you're traveling home three hours a week. That's four hours or three times a week. That's four hours a day. It's being being tired. Yeah. You know, you can't study. I always remember the fellas, I often mention them, like Niall Collins, Ian Fitzgerald, and we wouldn't have had anywhere near the workload. Like one is a partner in a law firm now and the other is a dentist with a few different practices and everything. And they're doing very well for themselves. But the study and day did when we were playing football. And I'd say they were the two that stood out to me. Like, I mean, I was wondering, how are they doing it? Mm. You'd play a championship under 21 match and they'd go home. After it, and it study is like, Jesus, this is just on a different level. We lost an under-21 All-Ireland final against Kerry on the Saturday. Um, I was in DIT studying marketing, and I was commuting. I was going in every day, and we lost that final. And I was so disappointed about losing that final that I didn't go into my end-of-year si- end exams on the Monday. I just refused to go into them, and I dropped out of DIT. <laughs> but like, before the exam. I was Jesus very, Christ. I was very immature. Um, and football meant that much to me that those exams were nothing to me. We've just lost an under-21 final. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's not just the time it takes. Yeah. It's, the me- it's uh, how much t- mental effect it has on you and how much you dream about it. And it's hard when you're a little bit immature to settle down to study because your mind is all over the place. You know, yeah. I, I, look, there's no fix to that. That's just maturity levels. But when you add in that... Uh, 65% of them feel their training load is neg- negatively affecting. So your training load is negatively inflecting your ability to study. Then you throw in the immaturity and the daydreaming and the disappointment. Uh, I don't know. Like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's tough. People don't understand that. It's good that it's kind of drilled down to because there's a blanket kind of uh, perception that like uh, inter-county GA now is a game for students and teachers because of the time that they have. But like you're, you have to differentiate the types of students. Like I did arts when I was in college. Like I, so I would have had time. plenty of time. Yeah. But no more than your, your mates that you were talking Talking of, they they were doing really kind of uh, labor intensive and study specific, intensive. They courses. wanted to be. That's the thing as well. They knew what they wanted to be. That's something to work towards. Most students aren't sure. Yeah. You're doing a generic arts degree or a finance degree or business studies. You have no idea what you're going to be. You're just yeah. doing it. Yeah. 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 You don't know what mark you need to get out of. So you're just passing. Yeah. You yeah. Know, whereas if you're doing one of those ones. You more or less know what exactly what you need to be. A lot of it comes back to career guidance in schools and and you know, giving students before they go to college an idea of what they want to be, what they're suited for. Yeah. We had yeah, terrible yeah, career yeah, guidance. Yeah. Like, I had no idea. You end up just going, what will I pick? What's everyone else doing? Like, you have no idea. Yeah. What's important to me? Football. I, mean, at least I don't really career. give a yeah. shit about it. I'll get a job through that, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and That's you're going for the I'm leaving cert. Like, in two months later, you're going into something that could dictate your career path and dictate <laughs> yeah, where yeah. you go in life. Something I was uh, thinking of earlier on when you were mentioning the training load and stuff is, is people like Brian Howard there a couple of years ago when he basically chose to kind of not play for the Sigerson team and I'd say there's there's pressure on internal pressure on some players to think that like well I don't necessarily have to go to county training but if I don't go I'm jeopardising my chances of making it like I know that's an individual decision and maybe that's where an inter-county manager has to step in and say and it's difficult for them to do too because they want to give them the chance to make the county team yeah. but somebody maybe has to step in and say no you can't because it's obviously negatively impacting mm. on your on your college performance yeah. No you're right though and uh, it's, it's, it's important to point out depends what like that's why you have no nothing but respect for Jack McCaffrey who's a doctor and studying the, wo- yeah. the study that's yeah. required yeah. for yeah. athletes like that's a, like you, you're right the arts degree like that's fairy tale stuff you know you have so much time you'd actually 
have too much time in your day and the training is a good distraction yeah. because you don't <laughs> have to go in on but it's the, the students who actually in tough courses like no disrespect yeah. to the arts uh, fac- I'm faculty one of them, so that's why I didn't mind calling <laughs> out <laughs> but there, there's, so, there's such a, a disconnect there's no sympathy for students like you know uh, one year we had a manager who wanted to come back on a Tuesday and you come back thinking like you're really doing everybody a service coming back here and it's like nobody gave a shit like you know you'd be late and they'd be getting on to you and you're like I've just come down from Belfast and then they'd be like well, what'd you do all day? Nothing like you know because they know that you're a student and you're not working as yeah. as long as they are. So yeah. there's not a lot of sympathy for no, students. there isn't, and there is that pressure. Like even I, I would have been a very relaxed student, but at the back of your mind the whole time is these exams are in the f- in the future. I'm doing nothing, and now there's that's a pressure on your mm. shoulders. Do you know? So there's another one under well being is 54 percent over half of the student uh, county players regularly feel overwhelmed by their commitments, and 62 percent find it difficult to manage all of the commitments associated with being a student. Um, athlete. You could argue that any athlete, any serious athlete has all these issues and mm. I'd say they do. I'm not saying this is unique to, to GEA at all. Yeah, it's just the reality of being an elite performer, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Connor, Connor Myler was at that launch and he said at the start of the year, I had to really prioritise my academics. But overall, you're asking yourself and having that conversation, is this Masters worth it? Um, it's not me. It's not doing me any favours here. I'm wrecked all the time. I'm spending ridiculous hours in the library, getting up really <coughs> early or staying really late. So he's kind of summed up pretty much what we're talking about. Paul Flynn was talking about this launch as well, and he responded to an article written by Joe Brawley. We mentioned it the other day, but not this part of it. So Brawley said that the GPA were unchecked, unchallenged and detached from reality. So it's important, I suppose, we point out Flynn's response um, to Brawley. He says there are a couple of things outlined that were factually untrue things around our commercial independence. We don't actually have commercial independence, just to clarify that. We have, um, through our agreement with the GEA, um, we have it through our, or we have through our agreement with the GEA, we aren't actually able to go out and engage with corporates on our own. We can do it through a joint venture that we have with the GEA. Um, so like, I mean, I suppose that's important to, to point out that they're not unchecked, unchallenged. Um, there is, you know, some sort of control from the GEA over them. And he took, uh, took up Brawley about saying they're unchecked and ungoverned. He says, we have very strong governing structures. Um, you were at our AGM. We outlined it all in our, in our annual report. We're fully compliant with the governance code for sporting organisations. We're audited by uh, Delight, a big four firm. We've got GA representatives on our finance committee. We have a mu- remuneration committee with three independents who decide on salaries. And all salaries are benchmarked against other sporting organisations and similar organisations that exist in our size so I've heard that one before I'd still prefer if they just uh, made them public anyway but it's important to point out um, like Broly just saying unchecked unchallenged detached from reality probably isn't fair um, on the GPA either yeah, well, it's, say on that? it's good to hear them like Paul Finn go into as much detail as I've heard about the governance structures of the GPA because to be fair no more than Joe Broly there's a few kind of high profile media commentators that would regularly kind of criticise the GPA and you don't maybe it's just me but I don't hear much of a response so at least it's good to hear that Yeah Paul Flynn's Finn. a fighter you see Flynn yeah. and I do think that Flynn is representing the players very well with John Horne I don't think he'd he'd be in any way fearful of the GA. I think he's he's uh I think he's doing a good job since since he's gone in there. I think the GPA having the I think they did put pressure on the GEA regarding championship structures. The CPA did more publicly, but I think Flynn did as well. They've both seats, and I kept saying it. My huge gripe with the GPA for the last ten years was the biggest problem in the GEA is championship structures. You're the union, fix it. They never did. If the championship structures are fixed uh, <coughs> in twenty twenty one. The rest of the stuff the GPA does, I'm not, like I said on Monday, I'm not overly critical yeah. of them. I think the players yeah. deserve representation and deserve to be treated well and all those things that go with it. Quickly, um, he was also talking about tier tier two and we've ta- we've over-talked this, lad, so we won't go mad into this. He says two thirds of players don't buy into this competition. No shit, I would say to that. Forget about Division 1. This is Division 2, 3 and 4 teams who could be directly affected by this as of next year and two thirds of them are against it. Again, do any survey uh, in leash club football with senior and in intermediate level and say who wants to play senior football? And I'd say you get a 95% uh, response that all players want to play senior football. Is this what we're actually talking about here? Some things players shouldn't have an opinion on. What was very interesting here, lads, is he said you couldn't disregard the possibility of a boycott just yet. <laughs> My God. So, right, get, let's get this right. Some counties might potentially boycott the Tier 2, which I think is just be a complete and utter joke, a farce. Who do they think they are? But the problems and the thing that these counties need to think of is they might not agree with next year's Tier 2. 
I could guarantee the following year when all the different stakeholders come together, a tier two will be part of a long term GEA structure. So are you against this tier two or are you against tier two in general? Because if you're against tier two in general, you're just going to have to boycott the next 10 years because that's what's going to come in. I can guarantee that's what will be part of the fixtures task um, committee going forward will be two tiers. Why? Because that's the sensible thing to do. And players shouldn't have a say, a say on this. Everybody, of course, wants to play at the top level. Yeah. There's a few coming out saying, well, that makes sense. We're playing at our own level. But they would obviously be of the of the idea that they will eventually get up to division the first level. So they're being a little, have a little bit more common sense. They were not re- really there yet. But in general, any intermediate player will want to play. Mm. So if they're given the option of a vote, do you want to play... With, uh, with all 32 in the same competition of course they're going to say most of them will say yes that's natural no no I like just like, but the sensible thing to do say would be to get rid of provinces but that's not going to happen like you know so I don't think that actually means that I think, it's a I guarantee think, that I think the provincials could be gone out of the, the one the following year or else pulled out of it I don't think the provincials would be part of the All-Ireland when this when it can't be well, so I'd be very you, surprised to see that. Do you that. think so? Just with the, the with the stakeholders holders involved it's commanded such a kind of prestigious place so far that I'd be just very, I'd like. I I wouldn't necessarily be against it. I like. I like Conan. I I think that um, it doesn't necessarily make sense. But I would be surprised that like some of the people involved would be willing to willing to get rid of them. Yeah, I think that the provincials will stay. But I think that if you want a fair start to the All Ireland, they can't be there, right? So they're the yeah. they're they're in the. Anyways, we're getting into a championship restructures. Um, thing then I just thought the idea of a boycott la- next no, year that's crazy. wrong though isn't it it's just wrong he just was obviously asked that as opposed to him he, he didn't bring it up he said, yeah, he, yeah, he, said yeah. he wouldn't rule it out yeah. right f- finally Frank McGlynn retired uh, this week um, top class player unbelievable year in 2012 got an Ulster I always remember his goal in the in the Ulster final that year um, against Down Down started that game uh, really well it just, just seemed to be able to run all day yeah. like an excellent player unassuming player you know like I mean it's not like the country will I think a lot of people appreciate Frank McLean, but he never really made a big deal of himself. You know, he, he was like an a, eight out of ten every day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, a little close in the seven, eight out of ten. He was just so consistent. The one, the one that got like he was perfect, nearly for that Donegal style of football around like maybe twenty eleven to twenty went well, well to, to the present day as well. <laughs> but like always, always had him as the guy that would you know pop up for one or two crucial points as well in big games too. Like yeah, yeah. really, really good. Very player. talented player too. It needs to be said. Like I mean, he he's a soccer background, played in. The Mill Cup with Wayne Rooney as we all know yeah. at this stage but has played wing back has played centre back has played corner back has played as the sweeper when Mark McHugh left and has also spent a little bit of time as kind of a makeshift half forward yeah. you? but like I mean that's seriously talented player but like you're right anywhere in the Donegal team from number 2 probably up to number 12 maybe has a you know are a kind of mashed in together so Frank McGlynn with his versatility you know and all round game just could float into any of those positions seamlessly yeah and I'd say nobody in the country is a bad word to say about him as well no. which says a lot to no. some man exactly Onogara retired as well um, oh, I think Owen, Onogara is the most decorated sub in the history of the, of the GEA <laughs> so he has nine Leinster titles he has seven All-Irelands he has five National Leagues and he never really started for Dublin, mm-hmm. you know? Like, I mean, so you wonder when you ask Onagara, how many All-Irelands have you won? And what would, what he, would say? he say? Yeah, interesting. You know, like, he, for me, in 2011, he came on for 13 minutes. So he won one in 2011. He was on after 16 minutes. Paul Mannion must have got injured in 2013 and don't exactly remember that. So now he's won two. He wasn't even in the squad in 15. So now he's won two of three. He got eight minutes in 2016, um, the first game, and he was an unused sub in the replay. He started the 2017 final, um, funnily enough. He only lasted 36 minutes. It was minutes. like a rabbit out of a hat yeah, from Jim Gavin yeah, last time. Surprise. It didn't work. And that was yeah. because Kieran Donaghy, remember uh, Mayo moved Aidan O'Shea back on Kieran Donaghy in the semi final? Oh, yeah. that was it. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, yeah, he was yeah, trying yeah. to get them to do the same thing, but it's obviously not the same correct. <laughs> <laughs> not really, no. So then in, in 2018, he was an unused sub, and 2019, he wasn't in the squad. So he played no part in, in three of the seven. So I suppose he has seven All-Ireland medals. He won four. Would that be fair? Like Roy Keane doesn't even count his Champions League medal and he, <laughs> he, he, won, he got them to the final. Now he, that's very, very extreme. Yeah. But like, I mean, I, it's just, it's very unusual for someone to hang around the squad as long as he did with never really being a starter. You know, I know like you get more time these yeah. days, but like he didn't see much game time. I was very surprised at 
he got more tributes when he retired than Paul Flynn and Bernard Brogan put together by the Dublin. Uh, Bono Gar did. Yeah, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. Just on his longevity, I think that he was such a different type of player to everybody else. I'd say that's why he lasted so long. Do you know, like he brought he brought something different to the Dublin attack. He was so phys- like I, that twenty thirteen final. I think he got injured at the end of that twenty thirteen final, having come on as a sub already. But he did do he did do damage. And obviously, Jim Gavin saw in him the potential to do something against Mayo that little bit different yeah. than what Dublin had been playing up to that point. So I'd say that's why he lasted oh, for so long. There's, there's and no was doubt, probably promised yeah. that he was. You know, we know what impact you can make. It probably been told that by Jim, Jim Gavin all along, which made him stick stick it at it for this long. Yeah. Well. Do you remember when he was brought in first under Pat Gilroy? Mm. He's one of the worst players I've ever seen. Now, the improvements, in fairness to him, over the next 10 years, like, this fella couldn't even solo the ball. Yeah. Like, he'd solo the ball and go way up over his head. He looked, like a, he looked like a junior player. Now, having to say that, as the years went on, he, he turned into a player that was a very, very effective player. In fairness, in fairness to him, he must have worked very hard at his game to go from being as raw as he was, lads. Like, Jesus. Now, I don't know, was it nerves, but he just looked terrible. Yeah. But towards the end... Some of the performance now, a lot of the time he'd come on in games and Dublin would have it won and he'd kick one, two and raffle one into the net. Yeah. So that's probably easy as well. When you think back to a tight game he ever did anything in, I don't really, they, none mm. of them are jumping to my mind. It's very easy to come on when you're hammering Derry and rattling one, two. <laughs> <laughs> that's not easy. Know, it's just that league final I'm thinking of in my head. It did like, really uh, well against Christy McCaig, actually. I remember that he? in the league final. Yeah. Or, or Leash, for example, or any, any county, you know, look, he was a decent player, like I mean, but you know, hanging around a squad that you can't get on ten years, you know, my aversion to subs, so yeah. I wouldn't have much time for that. It, but it is interesting because I thought the same, and like, yeah, I thought he was always a bit unbalanced when he was using his feet and stuff. He scored some screamers, but like, just never seemed that convincing. But he survived three managers, like three yeah. tough man, mm. and seven years of Jim Gavin, who <laughs> no problem getting rid of people. Did he surprise? Like, no, two managers. Gilroy brought him in. I think he was under Caffrey as no, well, wasn't it? No, no, no. Gilroy tried to change direct the direction Caffrey went, so brought. Uh, he definitely brought. Uh, right here, let's just, just cut this out, in. and then we'll we'll start the whole show. <laughs> oh, again. I don't think this is a debate. <laughs> I'm telling you that Gilroy brought him in. Yeah, well, like you know, but even surviving Gilroy and like Gavin, seven years of Gavin is probably the most impressive thing. Let's just focus on that point. Seven <laughs> years of Gavin. Yeah, no, you can make a good point just on Gavin alone without uh, dragging us into it. Right, lads, that's always time for. We will be back with Tig Morley. Um, he's coming up next. So on Saturday, Temple No play Riverwater in the Munster Intermediate Championship quarter final, and Tig Morley joins us on the line now. Tig, how's it going? Good, Colin. Yeah, it's, things are good now. Thanks, for, thanks it's, so much. It's fair to say these are great days for the club. Oh, certainly, yeah. Um, great excitement around local you now at the moment. The lead up to the game and the fact that it's uh, a Munster Championship game and we get to have it at home as well, like your order of space, the space was attached to that too. So uh, yeah, no, it's exciting. It's very exciting. No, thanks for God, yeah. So so it's an in- incredible rise. So you won the junior um, three years ago, 2016. You went on and won the All Ireland Club um, final. Um, then you came up to intermediate, lost the intermediate final, then won the intermediate uh, this year. You're in the Munster Club and you're going to be a senior team next year. So you're the, you'll be the only rural senior team out of the eight all the rest are from towns you know the big ones like Dr Croaks yeah. Legion Ratmore Austin Stacks Cairns O'Reilly yeah. Dingle and Ken Mayer yeah yeah that's right yeah um, how, so have, you, how have you done yeah, it it's, it's, it's a huge it's a, yeah it's a huge deal because the, the club was actually never seen her before uh, so it was actually it was a huge thing to get over that that sort of when the intermediate this year we were Close the last couple of years, we won the junior as you said that time in 2015, and we lost the final of the intermediate 16 and 17, and lost to the eventual winners in last year as well. So it's been we've been kind of close to it, so we were delighted to get over the line now this year and get senior. So it's uh, a huge deal for the club, and I suppose it'll be it'll probably really hit home maybe next year now when we're playing in the senior club championship. You know that we're we're at that level now, and even. Obviously, in Kerry, then when you play in the in the county championship on your own, then as well, so that'll really it'll really hit home. Then that we're we're at that level when we when we get to that stage next year. Yeah, no, it definitely does. So we have a mutual friend, um, and I stayed we with do, yeah. I, I stayed in his house recently. I was down in Kenmare for a wedding, and he lives just past Temple No, as you know. He lives up a huge yeah. hill, but we won't even talk about how far up a hill yeah, he lives. But that's 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 the point. Yeah, my Mr. Woods, yeah. 
he uh, he told me that he lives just after Temple Nolan. It was dark and it was yeah. about half past nine. And he says, ring me when you get past Temple Nolan. I'll tell you where to go. And I was gone miles past Temple Nolan. I rang him and says, when am I going to <laughs> land the Temple Nolan? He says, what did you see? Oh, I said, I just passed the church. That was always there. It wasn't a village. It was nothing. <laughs> and he says, that's Temple Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, guy. I know we're, we're a very small word. It's like... Uh, it has the church there in Tiplo and Spillane's Bar is there as well. It's uh, unfortunately closed at the moment, but yeah. hopefully in the next couple of years it'll open again. But that's, that's all there is really. To it's quite a small area, very small amount of people living around. And um, so it's it's amazing really to think the, the, the position that we're in, you know, even even within the county, as you said, within the senior and, you know, coming up against big uh, populations now, even in the Munster Intermediate Championship as well. So it's, it's, uh, we're, I suppose you could say we're punching above our weight, but we have, um, you know, we have a good group of players at the moment, so we're trying to make the most of our time now that we have this opportunity. Because you know, it, as it comes in cycles, you know, we're going to be struggling again in a number of years again. So it's about trying to make the best of what we have at the moment. Yeah, I suppose that's the thing. Like, I mean, I was reading as well. There's no national school. Like, I mean, like you said, there's very little in Temple No, and you, you know, I would say. Every club in Ireland has some national school feeding it. You don't. So you have to join up with uh, Sneem and Derry Nan at underage level. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, There's no national school no, in, the, in the locality at the moment. So um, all the kids go to the school here in Kilmere where I'm teaching at the moment. So um, at underage level then, yeah, we're kind of, I suppose our numbers wouldn't be huge. Like um, we join up with, uh, yeah, with Sneem and, uh, and Derry Nan there to, to, to manage make for, for underage teams. And, you know, there's a huge... Huge minus difference there between Tupelo and, and Derry Nan even you know, so it, it just shows the you know the, the, the problems that exist in, in rural clubs and stuff trying to feed teams and even with our own senior team like we're we're, we're stuck for numbers now. Our numbers are like the, the players that we have are, are of good quality but we're um we're tight with numbers as well, like you know what I mean? So it's not it's not simple to try and get everything everything worked out like even a lot of fellas are, you know, because we're in such a rural part of 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 Kerry and of Ireland as well, like uh, jobs and stuff like that as well. You know, there's a lot of fellas based at home, there's a lot of fellas based in Cork and Dublin and different places like that, so up in up in Limerick and stuff. So everybody's kind of based away, so it leads to challenges. Yeah. So how do you even manage that then for training during the week? So it's it's um, it can be difficult. Obviously, uh, we've kind of we have a kind of a training we train in a in a place of like an obsessed there called Bardov and lads from Cork can get there and if one of the lads from Limerick is available he can get there the lads in Dublin train away as best they can above Dublin with a club up there and we try and just meet again then at the weekends as best we can once or twice maybe a Friday and a Sunday over the weekend or something like that everybody together but it's it's difficult like um, and then when you know it's, it's numbers are low then during the week and if there's one or two fillers away like it makes an awful difference like and we had good number of lads involved because Kerry set up this year so you can imagine like numbers were way down like you know what I mean you're, you're struggling for numbers of training there and makes it difficult like yeah no definitely so you're the most represented uh, club on the Kerry team this year obviously the two Spillans yourself and Gavin Crowley all from this tiny little area which is an incredible achievement it, is, is this just a once in a generation I know um, is Tom Spillane used to coach you when you were younger what do you put it down to or because like Ken Mayer going through a bit of a golden generation as well beside you yeah I know it's, it's amazing really yeah it's just to have the four from the club was, was it was class really to be honest uh, and then you had two other lads from Kamir Stephen O'Brien and Shawnee obviously as well it was amazing uh, to have that kind of mentality there and you know, even we all were past two for the public school of Skana there so it was cool for the school there and they had the six pictures outside the outside the um outside the school there for the All Ireland and stuff like that and the town was the town and the locality around Temple and everything's like the flags and posters and everything and all just huge buzz around that time and it's uh, yeah it's probably the once in a generation kind of thing. It was kind of a bit of a wood off all right but uh, like there was a lot of years there there was nobody really from the locality on the carry set up um after the Spillans there, it was kind of a, a dry period for a while. Paul O'Connor was involved there in the mid noughties all right. Um, won a couple of all Ireland medals. But after that again, then there was, it was kind of slacking off until Stephen O'Brien came along again. So it was great. Now this year, there's so many local fellas and uh, it created a great buzz. It was great for the kids around the locality too. Like, you know, just even see the local fellas playing with Kerry and the big buzz that goes along with that. You know what I mean? And you know, to be able to see the likes of even like me here in the school or or even to see Shawnee Shea inside in the shop in Kinnear or something, you know, they see Shawnee in TV or they see, see him there in Ogany, you know, Claire Deer or something, and so they could 
walk down the street or going to shop and come there and meet them. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's huge for the for the kids locally to have the you know fellas playing with Kerry and to you know somebody for them to aspire to and want them to play for Kerry as well. Do you know? So it's, it's it's cool that way. Yeah, definitely. So there's six off the starting team. From Kenmare and Temple Mo, anyone listening doesn't know where Temple Mo is in relation to Kenmare. Like you're only four or five miles out the road, right? So, like, I mean, it is a yeah, it is a huge true, thing. Yeah. Um, so you may, you mentioned that there was there was a big gap then from the Spillans to you know year generation, and you were the first one to mm. start a championship match for for Kerry since the Spillans. And yeah, that was in yeah, 2016. Yeah. I was reading, that was incredible yeah. that you didn't play league in 2016. You won that junior All-Ireland and then you made your debut in the championship. So you went straight from playing junior club football at, to starting senior inter-county championship. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> um, I, told, um, I was involved with the and I got in for there would be a few signings against Kerry Seniors, so that would have been the 2015 season. They got the all in front that time, lost to Dublin. But I would have, I got in for a couple of training sessions there at the end of that year, leading up to the Tyrone semi-final and stuff. So I got a bit of a, a bit of a taste for it. Um, the end of that 2015 season, then I, I kind of had a good, decent enough county championship with the local district team from my district and kind of got called into the Kerry set up then for the following year, 2016, as you said. And then... Um, yeah, it was we had won the the Ireland Junior Championship, you know, so our training with Kerry was kind of limited. Myself and Gavin Crowley were together there; we were both all in the same time. And then it was kind of difficult to be honest because I was based in Dublin as well, so things weren't going too great for me there in the league. I actually didn't make any league panels or anything. As you said, it's a bit of a step up from uh, to football to senior in the county, so kind of that took a while to get used to. But um, we actually are going to stay at it and um, <clears throat> Eamon kind of knew me from Kerry Under 21s uh, when he was manager of Kerry Under 21s. I was there as well. So he kind of knew me, which kind of helped. And we went on a bit of a training camp one of the times there. We actually went to London for three or four days in a training camp and I performed well over there and it kind of got, got in as a, as a result. Right. But okay. um, it was kind of, I didn't really know myself, to be honest. I didn't really know. I was so fresh to it and so naive I didn't really know that you know you know, you know if let's say coming up to the game you know if you're going to be in the team or not or you know how well you're going etc when you're a couple of years into it or whatever but at that time I didn't really know geez, am I going well here am I even a chance to start or whatever I was so naive to it. in fact I was going very well in fact I was on the a team let's say for an ABB before the first chance of game but I was a bit distraughting like I didn't really understand <laughs> You know what I mean? It was just so naive. And um, after that training camp, they named and was like, you know, like be ready for next weekend or there's clear matches next weekend. So be, so be, be ready or whatever. So um, yeah, it was it was cool for the club now to have somebody starting with Kerry again, and it was big for my yeah. family and stuff as well. It came as a bit of a shock to everybody, all right, but. Thankfully, everything worked out that day, and it's going to move on from there. It's it's fantastic, um, and you were so inexperienced that when you came into the into the dressing room, it would be daunting enough. You sat in Gucci's seat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, it was like, Jesus, who am I after? Whose place am I after taking here? People worried where you're after sitting, and and ended up sitting in his place of all people. But um, I just found out about it obviously, but. Uh, yeah, I know the way everybody has their own little spot in the dressing room always. Yeah, so Tyke Morley has his own spot in the dressing room now, right? Uh, yeah, a couple of years ago, you know, you find your own corner, right? Yeah, <laughs> not too bad. Yeah. So, so, so Camille, you're a bit of an all-rounder because when you came onto the scene, the first time I kind of paid attention to you was in that league final against Dublin where you, you were did a great job on Kieran Kilkenny. You were centre-back um, then. You played full, you're playing full-back pretty much with Temple No, and now you kind of found that position with Kerry as well. Yeah, um, I suppose for the last few years it's probably been probably the half back line I've probably felt most comfortable and probably if somebody was to ask me what my position would be, it would probably be centre back. Um, now I would like I play I play anywhere, whether it be for club or county, whatever wherever I'm needed really. Um, I'd like to think I'm fairly versatile, and right? So I can play across any of the positions really in the the six back. So. I'm happy enough to toggle anywhere. Um, but yeah, uh, I suppose early in my career, career it was always in the half-back line I was. Um, I suppose it might, have been, it might have been last year or the year before. I think they were kind of, you know, was kind of looking at me for the inside backs, all right, the full-back line. But I don't 
know, when you have a big man who's trying to mark somebody like Kieran Donny inside there, uh, he's got a very different player. I don't know. I only left with a couple of sessions. I think he did. I was back out. I was back out to uh, the, the half back line again. But uh, this year, I think, to be honest with you, I think it was probably, I'd say, Peter Crowley's injury kind of forced him to think about me in the full back line. They probably had seen me play there for the, for the club, all right? And, um, Peter and the the, the the management probably said we'll have a look at a uh, tying in the full back line. I kind of kind of worked from there. Then I probably I played decently well there in the uh, intermediate club final, and it kind of went down from there. Then, so. Right. Okay. Mm. Because stay like, aware of in court really. <laughs> yeah. No. I know that. Yeah. You will. You will. But like, I mean, I presume the Kerry full back line at the same as the Dublin full back line because of the philosophy you have as teams you're exposed until your drifting players come back. So there's a point if the t- other team moves the ball fast where it's old school, there's a load of space in front of you and you're under pressure. Ah, you are, yeah. But sure, look, that's sure, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, <laughs> it was actually handy enough for me because I'm so used to it. With Tempano, we don't, we, we're uh, a free-flowing free kind of, you no know, real defensive system going through the ball kind of team. So right. I'm kind of, yeah, kind of used to that. And, uh, I could have a little bit of space in front, but... Uh, I don't know, you know, look as a, as a back. I suppose if you're if you're playing like that, as you said, and you don't, if there's, you know, you're waiting for a fella to get back or whatever, as long as there's pressure on the ball outside, you 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 you'll hold your own or you'll try your best. You know what I mean? But it's uh, it's when there's no pressure on the ball outside, you can be cut and bother, all right, uh, with the ball space in front of you. But um, I know I think uh, there was times this year, I would tell you, we might have been a little bit open at the back, but. Uh, as the year went on, I think it improved. I think you know we we played defensively. Defensively, we were quite solid the first day against Dublin, especially you know. So um, I think uh, you know the the our defensive plan, our defensive structure kind of kind of developed as the year went on. And I suppose that's been the the learnings that you get through the games, and we we, we definitely um, developed as the season went on. Yeah, you know, you definitely did. So you're going out in all Ireland final to Mark Mannion with his pace. What 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 are you thinking about? Because I suppose getting out in front of him is going to be difficult. But one thing I remember that you were good at doing is if he did get out in front, the minute he gathered the ball, you were able to hit him with a tackle. You know what I mean? To knock him off his stride mm. or to just to be close to him, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, it's a tough man to mark, uh, but pace and strength, as uh, as you said. Um, I suppose coming into the final, um, you know, we have a, a, a very good coach here in Dodie Boxy and um, even the, the, the management team there have good pointers for you, different players. You have to do your own bit of research in as well. So, you know, I, had, I, I knew uh, coming into the final, I was, I was lined up to be Martin Mannion, so I would have done my own research on him then as well. And, yeah, I suppose that was one of the things that we had kind of backed out, you know, I suppose it's the same with any forward, really. Once, if they are to get the ball, that's, if you're able to make contact straight away, you're kind of stopping them from what they want to do. Like they want yeah. to get the ball with no contact, turn and go at you. Well, if you're if you're able to get a hit on straight away or make contact straight away, you can kind of knock them off a bit anyway. So, uh, yeah, that was certainly something that was in the in the uh, in the in the plan if he was to get the ball, just to make contact early, try and stay as close as as I could to him. Easier said than done, but um, that was the, that was definitely that was definitely there in the head. All right. Do, do, do you have any regrets, I suppose, from the first day, that final 12 minutes? I don't know, have you did, gone back as a group or that's probably too difficult, uh, you know, at this stage or have you regrouped your, you, I know you're with Temple, no. Um, just kind of from your own point of view, that final 12 minutes when you went to point up, it, it, not pushing on from there, maybe? Yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, obviously, very disappointing when you think back. Um, I suppose we would have definitely... Um, Reviewed that um, after the first game, obviously, because oh, yeah. we were in the replay after, so we just we, did, we had two weeks there. We definitely had re- had it reviewed, all right. Yeah, we were disappointed, obviously, with certain aspects of it. Um, but you have to commend Dublin to the way they were able to, you know, their coaching and their their the, the decisions those the, their, their players make on the field. You know, the way they were able to press up on us with fourteen men and put so much pressure on the ball there despite having a, being a man down you know it was, it was, it was uh, very good by them do you know what I mean yeah. so um, but yeah I suppose we were disappointed we didn't keep possession well enough there when we had it because we did have the ball so I think we probably I'm not sure now I think we probably got all our kickouts in that 12 minute period I'm not even I, maybe one or two but we definitely got most of our a high percentage of our kickouts in that 12 minute period so we definitely had the ball but we lost it along the way in the transition from the back to the forward so we were definitely disappointed with that and something that we worked on between the two games but yeah looking back on it you know it's it's, 
it's definitely disappointing that we didn't convert any any more chances there in that sort of in the period. Yeah, well, you're definitely on the right uh, track, anyways, Tig. There's no doubt about that. Like, I mean, I was reading a stat that when Tomas O'Shea um, came on against Donegal, he was the 16 championship debut. Um, debutant Kerry had in two seasons and there was nine games in those two seasons so that's just an incredible turnover but this year you kind of maybe little settled a little bit as well and you know a lot to obviously to work on after rattling the dubs the way you did Yeah look it's great that there's so many new players being developed and so many new players getting their chance I suppose like the last year's management team Mr. Morris and his management team probably need to get a, a bit of credit for that too like you know last year they, they introduced a lot of debutants as well if you think of Gavin White and Michal Byrne and David Clifford obviously you know what I mean so they, yeah. they they developed them as well so they deserve credit for that too and then of course Peter developed more again this year so that's it's, it's great to see and there's you know you can there's definitely elements of a new team forming there so um it's definitely a positive going forward so hopefully we can develop more and as you said settle down and and you know, try and try and try and win that all and that we're looking for. Um, look, yeah, we were we were close to the dubs, but it's kind of a, like a close not close enough. Or you know, we were, you know, it's just it's tough to look back and I really to be honest with you because we're you know close yet so far or whatever you want to say. But the um, the uh, I haven't actually watched back much of the second game yet. Really, I haven't been able to bring myself to watch it. I watched the first ten minutes. That's turned off. <laughs> but the uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's tough, it's tough to think back on it, but we'll have to we'll have to review it at some stage definitely, and we'll have to look at the learnings I'm sure the management has and pick out things that we can develop going forward into next season. But um, yeah, it'll be exciting to get back into the you know obviously with the club now, but it'll be exciting to get back into the 2020 season now soon enough. Yeah, exactly. Well, I suppose Temple No is a good distraction for you at the moment, anyways, to maybe get over that uh, the All Ireland final loss and concentrate on something else. Come here, Tiger. Won't keep up any more of your time. I know you're trying to get back um, teaching. I, I suppose I'll see you at this stag that we're going to in a few weeks' time. Oh yeah, <laughs> maybe yeah. I was wondering how you got my number. Really. <laughs> <laughs> on the WhatsApp group, Tiger. Thanks very much. Yeah. All right, lads, Paddy Power predictions time and we're going to start with the three county finals, Tipperary County Finals on Saturday at 2.30. How disrespectful, just to start off with complaint about this, is it to put, I think we did an example of this last year, lads, with maybe Waterford or somewhere. So the county final in football is Clonmel commercials against J.K. Brackens um, on Saturday. The Boris Ali are playing Glen Rovers I- on the Sunday. Both, are, both of them are in Semple Stadium and the, the quarter final of the Munster Club is given precedence over a uh, county final. Not only is it given precedence over a county final, they wouldn't disrespect the hurling by putting the football even on the same day. Oh, the same day why didn't it? they do a double no, no, not having that. So Eamon Corcoran, you might know Eamon Corcoran from playing with uh, Tipperary. He'd be around my age. He says, personally, I think this undervalues the competition. He's actually chairman of JK Bracken's um, he's only my age so I thought that I saw Eamon Corcoran and I was wondering is that Eamon Corcoran that played with Tip and it, as it turns out it is so he says personally I think this undervalues the competition if you had it on a Sunday irrespective of where you had it I think you could bring a bigger crowd so he's not ev- he doesn't even mind if it's not in Semple Stadium he just wants to be able to have it on Sunday think about it lads 2.30 on a Saturday if you have a business in town any sort of a business a lot of construction um, you know works on Saturdays all those kind of things. You can't go to the county final. It's completely wrong. Um, and it shouldn't It shouldn't happen. Clonmel commercials are one to six favourites to beat J.K. Brackens. Interestingly, J.K. Brackens, they're only a new club. They, I think they started up in the 90s. So they're now in a senior football um, final. They're first ever. They won a minor and they won the last two under 21. So they're a real up and coming team. So they're interesting. I'd never heard J.K. Brackens before. Here's another interesting fact about J.K. Brackens. They're in the junior B hurling final in Tipperary last weekend I think they won it can't be 100% sure they have 13 players that crosses over from that junior B hurling team to the football team and the majority of them play in the same positions yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a good one because I always find it interesting in football who, where they play because uh, Clonmel commercials beat Noel McGrath and John McGrath's club um, Lock, Lockray Castlemore uh, Castlemore Lockray or something like that yeah it is that yeah. and uh Noel McGrath's midfield and John McGrath's full forward yeah. it's like yeah yeah I was thinking there wouldn't be anywhere else <laughs> other, other than those two positions but anyway so that's it um, you'd have to fancy Clonmel commercials lads here Michael Quinn Livin's the big story here he probably a little bit like Ben McCormick who we'll talk about in a minute 
um, probably hanging around for his club until the county final and he's heading off to Australia Australia then so 1-6 to 9-2 to two, uh, JK Brackens it's, it's some story of JK Brackens and they're like the, the second coming of Lock Moore who won the senior hurling of football in 2013 and obviously they've won senior B so they're going to be in the senior A hurling next year so yeah. they're, they're going well I have to fancy Cal Mel for this weekend but like JK Brackens will probably win one in the future they will win one in the future I've been the champions as well yeah but 6-1 to one and Cal Mel's reputation is too much 1-6 to six, yeah, yeah exactly one six, yeah. so Kerry final East Kerry versus Dr. Crooks this is a fantastic game I don't know why I can see exactly why TG Cahar wanted to put this on it. an interesting one about this is that if the county final if this final we know the whole thing about Dr. Crokes if they lose they won't actually be in the Munster Club it'll be Austin Stacks because they won the county final early in, earlier in the league earlier in the year it's not like Glen Rovers in Cork who lost to a divisional team and they're in the Munster Munster Club hurling uh, quarter finals if the Kerry County final is, is a draw at the end of normal time there'll be no extra time or penalties taken Instead, Dr. Crokes will go on to the Munster semi-final against Nemo or Newcastle um, West from Limerick. And a replay of the county final will take place after Crokes' involvement in the Munster club is, uh, is over. So I thought, that, I thought that was an interesting one. East Kerry are 11 to 10, slight outsiders, Dr. Crokes are evens. There's nothing in this at all, lads. You take uh, David Shaw is out for Crokes. He got a jaw injury in the semi-final and didn't, in the first semi-final, didn't play the replay. He's a big loss. I'll go for East Kerry here, lads. Uh, Crokes are going for their second four in a row this decade, which is incredible um, achievement. Again, it's a toss-up, really. I'm sure East Kerry would love that eventuality of a draw where they have to go away and train then for a yeah. month. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, too, yeah. Wait for Crokes to come back and play them. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with Crokes. Just, it's, it's sort of a Just to let you know now, this is Crokes' fourth game in 21 days. Yeah, and then you, did you write down it could be like so if they win this it's going to be five and twenty eight if they go into the monsters then? next week would be five and twenty eight which might be a bridge too far against Nemo Rangers who they'll probably play but four game in twenty one days coming against an East Kerry team who are really really strong mm. you know anyways I thought that might change your mind there, yeah, if Glanties can do it <laughs> <laughs> it's David Clifford against Tony Brosnan and Tony Brosnan loves club season so let's go with Crooks okay it's pr- probably a recency bias that I've seen East Kerry uh, on TV in the last fight they looked really impressive not just not just David Clifford who was like, <laughs> absolutely incredible ridiculously incredible but they looked like a really good outfit I haven't seen Crooks in a long time but just the momentum that they have whatever I'm going to go for East Kerry as yeah. well well you see the thing about it is the kind of style of football Crooks play they're not exactly going to be swarming David Clifford too much and they don't have unbelievably tight man-marking defenders. I was like thinking Ryan, it would be Fionn Fion Fitzgerald. He'd, he'd probably have to mark him, yeah. yeah. I don't think he'd be able for Clifford at all. Um, Brian Looney now has gone back wing back, sort of, who is a wing forward all for the last decade. And, no, Gavin, really and, and, Gav, and Gavin White. There's two of your half-back line. You're not getting yeah, much yeah. protection there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like, I mean, David Clifford could run amok completely. Um, so the Galway hurling final, Lee, Melio, Lee Mellows versus St. Thomas's. Lee Mellows are 5-4, to four, St. Thomas's are 4-5. to five. This is three county finals in a row for Lee Mellows, who hadn't won one um, in 47 years, two years ago. So they won their first one in 47 years. They're a town uh, club. Louis Mulqueen took them over, and he's after getting them to three county finals in a row. So, like, I mean, they're slight outsiders. St. Thomas's beat them in the final uh, last year. 5-4, to four, Lee Mellows, St. Thomas's 4-5. Yeah, I actually saw Liam Mellows in the semi-final against the Capitago. As did I, yeah, last yeah. year. And I saw them last year and this year, but they're much like they seem stronger this year. Now maybe it's just two one-off games that I saw, but um, and chatting to Alan, who's from Capitago, he was saying he was very surprised at all the players knowing every one of their players' names. So it shows the sort of preparation that Louis Mulqueen's bringing to it as right. well. Like, and just that little bit of detail, I think, might get them over the line. Did he find that strange? Jesus, I would know. Oh, would I? I'm trying to think. Would you know the opposition's team by five, the name? Five or six of them that you'd be keeping an eye out for. I don't ah, know. No, well, I would have known all of the names of the players that you'd be playing Depends when you get the county the final. At, is, ca- suppose, at county like, final yeah. time, you would yeah. know the names. At first round against the team, you don't often play. Obviously not. <laughs> county final times, I wouldn't think that's major. You'd be you'd be watching them. No, I don't know. I wouldn't think that's outrageous. But anyways, Mulqueen took them over. Um, they told him they were the eleventh best team in Galway um, when he took them over. They had been in relegation battles. Mulqueen uh, managed St. Joseph's Dora Bearfield to an All Ireland um, title. He was in with Loch Nan when he was with Galway, and he was in for the he was in with Davy Fitz with Clare when they won the All Ireland, and he was in for the Clare job this year, but pulled out obviously. So the likes of Lee Mellows are very lucky to have a manager of Louis Mulqueen's experience mm-hmm. over them. I'll give Lee Mellows the nod. St. Thomas's kind of 
I know it's hard to look back. I'm kind of against Croaks. The last time I saw Croaks was the All Ireland final last yeah, year. Yeah. Got hammered, and the last time I saw yeah. Thomas's was <laughs> the la- All Ireland. They got yeah. hammered as yeah. well. So I'm like I'm done with those two teams now. <laughs> They're no else. good. <laughs> um, I'll go Lee Mellows here. Yeah, me too. I think we'll make it a hat trick. Yeah, Lee Mellows. <laughs> okay, Connacht Club uh, semi finals. We're into provincial semi finals now. Les Tyr Connell Gales versus Padraig Pierce's from Ross Common. Tyr Connell Gales obviously from London. This is in London. Um, Tyr Connell Gales eleven to four outsiders. Four to eleven are Padraig Pierce's. I think there could be a shock on the cards here. I'd give Tyr Connell Gales a big chance. They have the likes of Mark Gotcha, Liam Gavigan, who we know um, is the London captain. The last time Tyr Connell Gales, 2017, played in the Connacht Club uh, Championship, they had to travel to Dr. Hyde Park to play Con- Clonna Gale, and they're only beaten 115 to 110. Clonna Gale got four points in the last 10 minutes unanswered to, you know, there was nothing in this game for a long time. Now, Padraig Pierce's, who've never played in this competition, uh, before have to travel to London I saw Pat Flanagan saying it's going to be difficult difficult to get everything organised we have to fly out on Saturday so we really only have a few days to get ourselves ready the whole preparation for a club team that's never had to do this before the excitement of going to London and mm. I think it could be a distraction I think Tyr Connell Gales are waiting in the long grass <laughs> and I think I'll go Tyr Connell Gales here lads Dr. Hyde Park, London. It's all the same for Hubert Darcy, so I'm going to go with uh, <laughs> Parry Pierce's. You'd never back against Hubert Darcy yeah, and Pierce, the Dailies. Pierce's as well. Uh, I saw, saw a good bit at the county final. I think they were a lot better than the eventual margin suggested in the Ross Common final. Yeah, Hubert Darcy, the Dailies. The, there's a couple other in there Curry as well. Really yeah, strong Curry, kind yeah. of uh, inter-county representation, so I'm going to go with Pierce's. All right, okay. So Corrafin play Ballantubber, lads. This is in Tume Stadium, which is a, a ground Corrafin only know too well. Mm. Um, this is a repeat of last year's final. So Ballantubber were well in this game I remember watching it 1-5 to 2 at half time and then they kind of got hammered in the second half 1-8 to 4 final score was Ballantubber 1-9 Corrafin 2-10 we all know Corrafin are a better team than Ballantubber um, it's interesting that Corrafin the Galway County final was put for two two more weeks so they didn't play it the following week they waited two weeks and now Corrafin have only a, uh, you know the seven day yeah, turnaround yeah. where they could have just played the replay the following week and given them more of a run into this because it's not a good draw for Corrafin coming off a county title I wouldn't think Corrafin are at the stage in a seven a row where they're going on it all day Monday and like I'd say there'd be only like you know a few of few. them maybe go on the Monday they're <coughs> so used to it now maybe I have that wrong but yeah. um, you know with a with a provincial quarter final or semi final coming up the following week they might have left Monday off yeah I know I know they drew last year's final as well didn't they or like but they, they, they drew last year's final close. yeah so I think it's good for them like, there was a stage there where they were just pissing through Galway even though there was only a week between like this final and or, and the Ballantubber game I think it's still good that they're getting those competitive matches this early so I fancy them to be sharp yeah Ballantubber only had the week as well they beat the Leitrim champions there at the weekend so they've only had a yeah but they have a week after winning a run yeah, at the yeah, game I or suppose, a county yeah. finals I, I just think the odds for Ballantubber are very long like I've I've seen a lot of Ballantubber like played against Ballantubber this year and then seen a lot of them because all the um, championship games were on Mayo GA TV like it, it's not a whole lot different from what they've done before but they're very very tough to play against like yeah, they, they play a defensive they're quite defensive football, but yeah. at the same time like they're, they they put on a high press and then managed to get a lot of bodies behind the ball right. like I remember like they hammered us in the league and just thinking that playing in the back division that you're just absolutely suffocated by you didn't have a second the forwards yeah. were over, over in your second in a, in a minute and then like you were trying to attack and they seemed to have bodies back <laughs> behind the ball as well like very fit and even outside of their like they've a lot of, they've game changers in uh, Jason Gibbons and Jim O'Connor which is as strong a midfield as you'll come across uh, Killian didn't play last weekend actually I'm not sure is he fit for fit for this weekend then uh, Michael Plunkett centre back really strong spine and then outside of that they're very solid I still think the Carfin will beat them uh, they had seem to have their number they've beaten them a few times in the last few years but it won't be I, I just thought 4-1 to, one to yeah I completely agree Ballantubber are worth a punt at 4-1 to one. Yeah. Carfin at 1-5 to five, I do agree you'd fancy, have a slight fancy for Carfin but not at those odds at all I would agree with that um, Leinster, so yeah I'll go Carfin but in a, in a close enough game uh, Leinster Club uh, quarter final so Newtown Blues play Ballyboden St Endes this is in Drogheda at half past one uh, Newtown Blues are 6-1 to one here Ballyboden are 1-10 to ten. last time Ballyboden won Dublin was 2015 they travelled to St Pat's from Loud and they just got over the line against them 1-8 to 7 points so Declan Amatney was referring to that um, today I know f- uh, that's 5 years ago or 4 years ago now but at the same time, they need to be on their toes. But I think we'll all agree Ballyboden will, will win this one. Yeah. Yep. St. Patrick's from Wicklow play Port Leash. 
Um, that's in Ockram at one thirty. God, the Battle of Ockram, eleven to four. St Pat's Port Leash are four to eleven. Uh, this is a tricky one for Port Leash. St Pat's obviously beat for Ban in the last round away from home, which is a is is a, a very good result. Last year they lost to Road. Uh, badly in the Leinster Club but they had beaten Rat New the day before that Wicklow County final went oh, to a replay yeah. do you remember that mm. so it's hard to know um, I'd be worried for Port Leash in this one based on their county final performance you'd be hoping the Leinster Championship will lift Port Leash mentally because it usually does it's like a start of something new and Port Leash aren't the big fish anymore and aren't the hunt they're not the hunted they become the hunt you know the hunter yeah. and that, that yeah. mentality thing is important so I think Portlaoise will just about get over the line in this but there won't be much in this at all ultimate tough place to go Achram. yeah um, but I'm still going to go with Portlaoise yeah. I'm not going to back against you yeah same as yeah it'll be tight as well I think it'll be tight but I'll go for Portlaoise Gary Castle play Ratote in Cusick Park at one thirty. this is evens um, Ratote or, or 11 to 10 Gary Castle or evens so John Keane um, was talking during the week we're not getting carried away we intend to take this campaign one game at a time very exciting stuff from John uh, <laughs> Ratote are a very good team with plenty of pacey footballers who like to play a fast attacking style of football so I, w- I was interested to see that John Keane is manager of Gary Castle with Gary Dolan so Desi after the county final and the change at halftime was giving his brother all the credit yeah. for taking him <laughs> off so in my head she's Gary Dolan's their manager and then I was looking at this what's John Keane doing talking about uh, <laughs> Gary Castle John Keane obviously is a former all-star cornerback I've marked him in a Leinster yeah. final brilliant player former teammate of mine um, in Minute. He was w- over the Westmead under 21s last year. So now I'm starting to think maybe it's not the two Dolans taking all the credit. Maybe yeah. John Keane had a little bit of influence over whipping Desi off at halftime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't a conversation with his brother yeah. at all. Yeah. yeah, this boy's not up to. Maybe that's why Desi's not involved anymore. Yeah. Nah, he's retired. But um, it, Ratouf's actually really interesting as well. Like their population's grown like. 300% in the last 10 years yeah. or something like that so obviously benefit of being a commuter town um, don't know much about the, the, the specific of their team but I'm going to go with them yeah, they yeah so am I yeah, they, uh, they gave didn't they give Summerhill a decent they, 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 they had a good tally against Summerhill yeah well they, they, they the two Wallaces anyway. who were flyers and they've Brian McMahon and yeah. they've Connor Gill full back who's an all-star uh, nominee, nominee this yeah. year so they have plenty of talent throughout their team and they're again up and coming yeah, I'm going to go with them. I'll go Ratote as well, although I backed against Gary Castle last week and uh, didn't work out too well for me. Aerog, the last one, lads in Leinster, they play Sarsfields. Aerog are 15 to 8 outsiders, Sarsfields are 4 to 7. Can't see anything outside of a Sarsfields win, even though Ben McCormack has gone to Australia. So I thought that was an interesting one. He hung around for the county final and then went. Um, so I still think Sarsfields will be too good for Aerog, who kind of struggled to get over um, the. The, the Wexford champions last week so I'll go Sarsfields here yeah me too Sarsfields Munster Club uh, semi-finals lads we won't spend too much time here these are pretty one-sided games Milltown Malbe 2-5 to five to beat Rat Cormac from Waterford who are 5-2 to two. Um, and Nemo Rangers from Cork 1-40 to 40 to beat Newcastle West um, from Limerick uh, at 11-1 to one. are we both going Milltown and Nemo here there's a, yeah. a dairy man playing for uh, the Waterford champions Ralph Gormick uh, Cal Croich playing cornerback with yeah. him so, um, what's he doing down there I don't know actually. followed his heart <laughs> he's followed his heart hope he's not commuting yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a joke <laughs> 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 and he goes back midweek for training <laughs> he's a fond veal man from Derry but now he's uh, living down in Waterford obviously not commuting um, <laughs> um, so I would like to make the case for them but uh, J- Jason Curry Jason Gleeson they're doing the damage for them up top but I can't see past Milltown Malton very nice bit of work on Rack Harmouth there <laughs> Colin you must have had a, a minute or two this morning <laughs> uh, Munster Club Senior Hurling semi-finals just to finish up on so Boris Ali are 10 to 11 to beat Glen Rovers who are 10 to 11 Boris Ali are 11 to 10 sorry um, this is in Semple Stadium a weird one with Glen Rovers as they lost the county final so it's hard to know where mm. their heads are at. So you kind of feel like a fraud, wouldn't you? Landing into a Munster club after not being able to win mm. your county. Now, it's Middleton uh, nearly beat Ballygunner last year after losing the Cork final. But Middleton wouldn't be the same prestigious club like Glen Rovers who've won 25-odd county titles. You know, I think their ego... I think when you're as big a club like Glen Rovers you haven't won your county final I think they'll go in thinking oh god you know this is a bit embarrassing I, yeah. maybe that's going I would say that's probably going through their heads yeah like uh, some people might argue that like you know this is the only chance they have now of winning something but like surely they've been flattened a bit by not winning Cork yeah. and 
Yeah, like you have to imagine the training, the intensity is just stepped off a little bit. People might not even, I don't know, but they might yeah. not be there, or like just not as consistent. Now, having said that, to beat Boris Leader in a Munster final, now, now they're yeah, back. They're Do you know what I mean? This is, they're in yeah. the no man's land kind of here, you know? And Boris Lee winning the county title was a huge deal for them. Hadn't done yeah. it in over 30 years. It was only, it was, what, seven days ago? I'm sure they, listening to Paddy Stapleton on Monday, they obviously celebrated heartily on Sunday night, whether they went into the Monday again. Oh, so they were. He was outside a pub so on Monday. Well, like that, that, that could have its impact as well. So um, I think Glen Rover's slight favourites. So yeah. I'd, say Boris Lee, I'd say Boris Lee were drinking Tuesday and maybe went back training Wednesday. Jeez, you have to celebrate. It was interesting, mm. just to bring this up, it was after Nave Connell beat uh, Castle Rahan, um, who was interviewed. I think it might have been their manager. And he said they enjoyed the Wednesday night and they enjoyed all day Thursday. And still went and beat Castle Rahan because they said it was important to to if you can't win a county final and enjoy it. And I was just going, geez, that's fantastic. I mm. thought maybe when they beat them, they might not have. But that's uh, for me, and that's what I was saying. They should have done that yeah. that way. Like, why? What's the point in winning it yeah. if you don't celebrate it? And it's just bad luck in the scheduling of it that you could get caught the next day, and they didn't get caught. Yeah. So just to pull some Nave Connell compliments in, into that here what do we make of the Boris Lee mascot so they have a rooster I do we call, heard it, about it, do we call it a rooster so it was in <laughs> all the pictures um, after the game and uh, I was just thinking is, is, could this take off this is a big thing in college football in America obviously every team has their own mascot like I mean bringing out uh, or a mascot onto the field I don't know I thought it was funny in the pictures I thought it added an extra little bit of theatre yeah. like I was saying to Paddy I'm not against mascots <laughs> any team want to have a mascot you could have Jim Gavin leading out an animal before the <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see that <laughs> I was just going to ask you you prefer mascots rather than all those kids who were doing the parade before the leash final oh lord no I didn't like that I, did, I thought that but then again yeah I just was I, was I telling you recently that one of the Port Leash players was explaining to me about that that you could be just in the parade and this has become a thing in the last three or four years with Port Leash that all these children get brought around in the parade. You could be just standing there, focused, not wanting any children. A child could be just put into your arms. <laughs> you're handed <laughs> one. You're handed a child. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to carry the child around in the parade and you've had no like choice. Football, just yeah, they're just <laughs> handing them over the fence. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think even if I was still involved with Port Leash, I'm, I'd be powerless to stop this. These are just children being thrown at players. A terrified child is being carried around on the pitch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, I, I, don't, I don't like you comparing mascots, which I'm for, <laughs> with the parade, which I'm against. I'm confused. I don't know what to think here, Conan. You've completely rattled me. Adam, that's got a bit of fun and I'm sure the, yeah, the, the, the kids all enjoy it as well maybe that will keep the kids off the pitch if they're just enjoying playing like, with the, the mascot, mascot yeah running after a little kitten or something <laughs> like that um, right Bally Gunner finally lads play Patrick's well um, Bally Gunner 4-6 to six. obviously they're flying it uh, they've won I think they're up to 6 or se- 7 in a row now in, or 6 in a row in Waterford and they're defending champions Patrick's well um, probably aren't the same force as Napiershig but beat Napiershig in the final if that makes sense to you um, Bally Gunner 4-6 like I said Patrick Swell 6-4 interestingly in this one is, li- is the n- n- how do you pronounce this word lads Natal Natal O'Grady um, would you yeah. say Natal Natal or maybe yeah Natal Natal O'Grady um, is the coach of Patrick Swell but he's also um, the manager to Tipperary Sean Tracy's who beat Kiladangan last week in the Tipperary Intermediate Final and they're playing Bally Saggart who is the Bennett's club in Waterford. They're playing them in the Munster club semi-final. So he's a coach. We obviously um, know he's not the manager of of, um, of Patrick's Well, but he's the coach of Patrick's Well. He's a Patrick's Well man, but he's also the manager of Sean Tracy's. He's going with his own club. He says, ah, it's going to be going with Patrick's Well, your home club. It's, it, it's, your home club is your home club. It's not really an issue because we've all the preparation work done in advance with Sean Tracy's. And then I was thinking, do you not have all the worked on in advance with Patrick's yeah. well I would say if you commit to be a manager that supersedes being a coach no now I know your own club is a different thing but I'm sure he's getting his expenses for going to Sean Tracy's in Limerick etc etc I was it's not an easy one definitely not but if you're a coach of a team on match day what's your role necessarily you know you're not the manager you're part of a backroom yeah. team but whereas you're the manager of the other team and I think it's more important you've all your preparation work done in advance what if the opposition team throws a spanner in the works and you have to change your plans then 10 minutes into the game is it not the job of the manager That's on the, the line thing. to make those and decisions and Patrick's well have Kieran Carey who was in the running for the, Gal- or the Galway job they have him to make all those decisions I don't think uh, Nat- Natal O'Grady is as important to Patrick's well as he is to Sean Tracy's and I think he should fulfil his commitment to Sean Tracy's yeah like no. 
a lot of coaches obviously have such an influence as well on the line and in the changing room and stuff. Maybe he is involved actively during games, but, but yeah, maybe he is. He used to be the same. Or he used to be the Patrick's well manager in thir- in thirteen fourteen. So maybe he look. He's clearly a very. Uh, He's clearly a good manager. I, well, I'm not going to say very good because I don't know enough about yeah, him. Yeah. But I don't know. I just thought that if you've committed to a team outside yeah. your yeah, own county, call, it like is a definitely a tough call for him. But, but I think he's he's too important. He's mo- way more important to Sean Tracy's than he is to Patrick Swell, and maybe should have gone with them. That's it. He's, he's not the manager. Like I can see the dilemma because that's obviously Patrick Swell's his club. You know, and you yeah. want to be there. Oh, no, as well. I'm not saying there's not a dilemma no, here. <laughs> Stevie putting words in here. <laughs> but yeah, like yeah. He's not the manager. He is the manager of another team. Yeah, I think I don't think there is a choice really. Okay, who are we going for here? Uh, I I I might chance. Jeez, you know how I went against Bally Gunner last week. I look. I've no. I've, I'm saying a draw. I have to sit in the fence here because I kind of half fancy maybe Patch as well to cause a shock against Bally Gunner. But I also went against B- Bally Gunner last week and I got uh, my comeuppance when they hammered Six Mile Bridge. So maybe a draw. We haven't had a draw. I'm going to go with Patrick's well because Needle O'Grady obviously <laughs> has a big role to play and he's going to be there. Yeah. So yeah, Patrick's well. No, Bally Gunner for me. Okay, right. Listen, that's all we've time for a very long show today. We'll be back on Monday and we'll review the weekend's uh, club stuff. So we'll talk to you then. Good luck.